been some new new kind of recommendations. They're not even mandates, but you know, I just thought I'd wear a mask just to make any, anybody that might need to feel more comfortable, more comfortable. But when I get up here, hey, I'm not wearing a mask. There's a, there's a scripture in Acts, it talks about Paul and Barnabas. They went into a city, and people were not happy that they were talking about Jesus. And uh, some of that stuff's going on in Portland, right? And, uh, well, they went into the city, and uh, they started sharing about Jesus. And people started to respond, and things, you know, people started coming to the Lord. But the, the, the people there were unhappy, some of the people. And so they took rods, and they started beating them. And they beat them, and they beat them, and they abused them. And they threw them, in, the public officials threw them in jail. And then in the middle of the night, Paul and Barnabas started singing songs, started singing about Jesus, started singing about their hope in Christ, started singing about the resurrection and what the reality is, not here, but beyond. And the reality of the, that the Lord is bigger than all of it. And they sang with joy and they sang with peace in their heart. Let's stand. They sang with joy and they sang with peace in their heart because they knew who God was beyond this world. And then sometimes when you see things happening around you, you're like, you can get your focus on that or you can start getting your focus on the Lord and the reality of who God is. And this morning as we sing, I want us to, I want us to really get our eyes off the world. Get our eyes off what the world says we should be doing or shouldn't be doing, what we should be thinking, what we should not be thinking. And listen and let the Lord's, let the Lord's voice be the biggest voice in the room, be the biggest voice. Amen? Amen. Let's go there. One of the things that we don't sing often enough about is our reality when we are going to be raised from the dead. So let's, uh, one, two, three, four. I'll fly away.
You like that song? All right. I kind of figured you did. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon him. But final breath he gave, as heaven looked to him, the Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, yeah, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The
Amen, amen. Amen. All right. Hey, you may be seated. Share, uh, Christina Hignite has some announcements for us. All the way down here. All right. <laughs> so um, I have some announcements. Today, right after church, there are two lunches. The first is going to be for the seniors. They're going to uh, meet right after church, and they're going to carpool to Jerry Staten's for a good old-fashioned picnic. And then also, oh, oh, it's not. The senior lunch is not. Okay, all right. So I'm sorry. I think you did tell me that. So uh, just the senior lunch today, and that is it for that. And then for home groups and Bible studies, um, they're going to start September 12th. And um, this is just a really nice time to fellowship together and really grow strong in your faith with each other. And some that are being offered are going to be precepts, and that's on Sundays here at the church from 9 to 10. Uh, the Pitroffs are going to have a home group on Saturdays early evening. The seniors are meeting here at the church on Tuesdays from 1030 to 12. There is a grief share on Tuesdays from 6.30 to 8 here at the church. The Setzers are also going to have a home group on Thursdays from 6.30 to 8 p.m. And then the women, we are not sure exactly on day and time yet. If you have any input or are interested in that, if you could put it on your connection card and drop it in the offering. Um, and then there are two women's events coming up. Hot Mess is going to start again Woo! on <laughs> September 13th. We're going to start September 13th to give everybody a chance to, you know, be done with their summer vacations. Um, and then that'll be every Monday at 630. And it's just a time for a low-impact exercise with each other. Um, it's a time to worship together and fellowship and just have a good time through exercise and then the other thing is the women's retreat at Cannon Beach Christian Conference Center. It's going to be from Friday to Sunday, September 17th through the 19th, and it costs $202. All the details are in this packet at the kiosk, or you can talk to Sharon. Um, and then there's only four spots left, so if you could go ahead and sign up for that, um, that would be great. Um, and this is just going to be an awesome location with the beach, and there's a great speaker, worship, food, and getting to know each other. So if I could have the ushers come forward for the offering, and I'm going to pray for the offering. Lord, thank you so much for this time together. You tell us to give with a grateful heart. Lord, we give you our offerings today with a grateful heart because we know that there is nothing that we have that you haven't given us. So we give this back to you freely so that you can use it the way it's supposed to be used so that we can reach others, that they would come to know you. Amen. Well, good morning. So my name is Christina Heron. Those of you who don't know me, I am the children's ministry uh, director here at the church. And I... <laughs> Thank you. Your check's in the mail. Um, anyway, I uh, oversee all the children's ministry here at Real Hope. And I just want to give, oh, sorry. I just want to give a little ministry update since last spring. Um, many of you know Darcy was the ministry director. Uh, when on maternity leave, I came in as the interim. And um, when she decided to stay uh, home with her babies, yeah, which is an awesome thing. I had just the opportunity to really um, come up and take this position, and it's just been a huge blessing. Uh, our Awana, last spring we ended on a really high note. We had our Awana Grand Prix, which was amazing and fun. If you came to the Awana Grand Prix, put your hands on your head. If you came to the Awana Grand Prix and had a good time, wave your hands in the hair like you just don't care. So if you did not... You really missed out. It was a lot of fun. We had a really good time. You can tell I work with kids all the time. Um, and then we have our Sunday school every week. So we have some kids in here, but we have um, teachers that faithfully come every week to not babysit, but to minister to their brothers and sisters, their little brothers and sisters in the word of God. Because children's church is not babysitting. And it is not just a place we shove off kids so they don't disrupt. It is a place where we teach kids at their level 
about the truth of God's word. These are your, these kids in the back and you see sitting here, these are your brothers and sisters. They um, are learning just like you are. And I'm just so thankful to each of those teachers who have stepped up this summer. Uh, we also had a few of our kids graduate out of our children's church and go to our youth group, which is amazing because, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. And it's really cool when they can do that because um, they grow in their, you know, the Bible says to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what we really want to see in our children's church and our youth in our youth. I think somebody's phone's going off. Anyway, uh, if there are youth that you know, um, there is a Lake Day next weekend. I've been asked to promote it. If they would like to go, um, they need to fill out one of these permission slips. So I will be at the back kiosk. Also, this week we had our five-day club VBS. It was amazing. That's all my workers. The cool thing about it is all the leaders were under the age of 19, every single one of them. And they did an amazing job. We saw 32 kids, shared the gospel with 32 children throughout the week. And it was amazing, even though it was really hot <laughs> towards the end of the week. We just had an amazing time and really enjoyed it. Um, for this next year, we have Awana coming up. Maybe you're somebody who's like, I really want to help. Well, Awana is a great place to plug in. It's on Wednesday nights. Uh, I have a lot more information about that. You can come see me. Maybe you would like to help out in the classrooms during the week. And if you're like, I'm really scared, don't be scared. We have people who will come up alongside you because we have so many kids. Right now, today, there are 21 children in the children's ministry divided between three classrooms. That's a lot. We want to add a fourth class so that we can have some more intimate one-on-one um, -on -one time with the kids to teach them the word of God. So we're just looking for some help to get, start that to happen in September. So if that's something you feel called to do, you can come see me. I will be at the children's ministry kiosk. If, uh, if you just want to help in a class, we have a place for you too. If you want to hand out snacks, sing songs, help with color sheets, that's awesome. You want people that will do that, right, Braden? You want someone to help you sing a song, color some stuff. See, you could work with Braden. He's an awesome kid to work with. Um, so definitely let me know. If you're like, listen, not really my thing to sit with kids. That's okay. I wish you'll prayerfully consider otherwise. However, we need snacks. Buy big boxes of Costco snacks to help us give snacks out every week. And the most important thing we need is prayer. We just ask you to add us to our, your prayer once a week to just pray for our ministry. So thank you. I will be, if you have any questions, I will be in the back uh, at the children's kiosk after uh, the check-in kiosk after church. So definitely meet with me. And those of you also who are going to come to the luncheon today, we did cancel it. We will postpone it for another week. But thank you guys very much. Have a great day. We are so privileged to have Christina and, and her old family uh, really um, just showing up in children's ministry and just knocking it out of the park every week. Thanks so much, Christina. Yeah. This is my story. It's your story. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope. To begin, your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested in my life, began. Ash was redeemed, and new beauty remains. Yes, in my orphan heart. I'm a 
Criminals call and darkness rejoices though heaven had gone. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested in my life. Jesus. 
Come on. This is about us, right? I needed shelter. <laughs> Wait a minute, let's start that again. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But time break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a sister. Inside the mystery, see the empty cross. It's empty. See the risen Savior, victorious and strong. No one else above him. None is strong to say.
our resurrected Lord. He's not on the cross. He's not in the grave. He's risen. He's risen. He's risen. Because he's risen. He infuses us, Lord God, with the hope. Not the hope so maybe so, but the reality. The source. He is the source of our hope for the resurrection. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you make you, your power, Lord God, will make our resurrection real. We have no doubt about that. Thank you, Lord God. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Lord. You are glorious. You're amazing, Lord. We love you. And for everyone here this morning who does not know Jesus Christ, I want to just let you know he is the source of your hope. Maybe you've been coming to church for a while. You know the Bible. Maybe you've read some of the Bible, but you don't know Jesus yet. Oh, if you think he's just somebody that we sing songs to, no. We sing songs to because we know him. <laughs> because of how wonderful he is. His power, his goodness, his faithfulness, his kindness to us. That's why we sing. That's why you hear people all around you singing. Lord Jesus, we love you. We love you, Lord, because of who you've been to us. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Kids, it's time for you to go to uh, class. Teachers are going to take you and show you a great time, share some powerful stories that are true that they've seen to be true in their life as well. Amen. I want to thank you for being gracious and allowing me to just be at home. Last weekend, I, I was not doing well and uh, had, you know, anyway, I was, had a bad cold. Not COVID. I said cold. <laughs> I am so entirely blessed. The Lord is doing amazing things. The Lord has brought workers and uh, our staff is... Such a blessing to us, Christina and Sharon, and uh, even our janitors, just a wonderful team of Christian people. But what I'm saying really is the Lord is doing his work through them and through you. I just want to remind you, this is not a church where the pastor is the center figure. I am not the center figure. Jesus is the center figure. You, Kendra... Joey, Peggy, Marty, Noah, Karen, you're the servants of God. You're the shepherds. You're the evangelists. You're the one that tells the story. I tell the story on Sunday morning, and sometimes throughout the week I get the privilege of doing that, but it's not about this. I, wanna, I just want to do this to encourage you and to challenge you to help bring you back to that reality after, after the world's trying to scrub that from your memory all week, right? <laughs> trying, to, trying to help you bring, bring you back into the Word. And then also, hopefully every day you go into the Word. But I, it's so good to be together, to be in the same place, to hear each other's voices. I, I stand up here and I sing, and Josh is playing drums, and Sharon's playing, and Belinda, and Rebecca, you know, the whole team is playing, and that's great. We have, have a lot of fun. We do that rehearsal. But to hear the heart that's coming out of your chair, <laughs> it blesses me. It just so blesses me. Because I sense that from your heart is this worship and this love to God. And what more could I as a pastor want? That you, that you are just giving yourself on Sunday in worship. That you're giving yourself at work. That you're giving yourself in your family. That, you, that, that you're saying, I have decided to follow Jesus every day. <laughs> that, that's the goal. If we're following Jesus, then the people that are following us, guess where they're going to end up? They're going to end up with Jesus. They're going to end up with Jesus. It's cool. Hey, let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians. 
We've been in a series in 1 Corinthians for a number of weeks. Some of you have been watching online. I just want to say to everybody online, we're so glad you're there. We're so glad you've joined us this morning. Uh, we hope that you find these messages inspiring and that you're lifted up and comforted and encouraged and challenged that as you, as you are remote there, that, uh, that you will just uh, be filled with the Lord's uh, spirit, that you, that you will be swept into uh, God's will as you choose to follow him just the next step. So Paul here in chapter 15, he's nearing the, the end of his letter, writing his letter to the Corinthian church. And he's writing this letter, remember, in response to their request to help them figure a few things out. They have a number of concerns. They have some questions. How does this work? What do we do in this case, say, situation? They've got some actual issues going on. And so they, they reach out to Paul and they say, please help us figure this stuff out. And so Paul writes his response uh, to help them, pardon me, to help them address these concerns. In chapter 1, Paul addresses uh, the issue of church unity. There's some division in the church. So he addresses that in chapter, and in fact, he spends four chapters on unity. Kind of tells you how important that is. Chapter 5, he, he addresses an issue of sexual immorality within the church. Chapter 6, six uh, Paul addresses the, the damage being done by their mishandling of conflict between believers. Chapter 7, Paul outlines God's plan for marriage and how that, what that should look like in the life of the believer. Uh, starting in chapter 8, Paul begins to address his next topic that he'll be on, oddly enough, for another four chapters and, uh, by saying, now concerning things sacrificed to idols. There were a lot of temples in Corinth. There were like 26 temples, so idol worship was a huge thing. And so it is no surprise that he would spend four chapters on uh, things sacrificed to idols and how to live out our life as believers in a very pluralistic society like Corinth was and like we, we are in. Uh, then in chapter 12, Paul starts out, now concerning uh, spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be ignorant. I, don't, I want you to know what's going on with that. Now, after Paul addresses their concerns, I can imagine Paul saying, okay, I've, I've addressed their uh, I've addressed your concerns and your, your, uh, the things that you're concerned about and uh, you're answered your questions, but I want to I say something here. Imagine Paul is thinking these are all important issues. He doesn't want to minimize their questions or their, the fact that they brought these issues up. He says these are all good questions you've raised, but I want to make sure that as you deal with these issues, you don't lose sight of the most important things. The most important thing, in fact. So Paul begins chapter 15 with the words, Now I make known to you, brothers, the gospel which I preached to you. Hey. You're fine. I know that happens. That means you're trying to get with the word, right? So that, that's good. That, you know. He, he says, these are all important issues that we're addressing here. These are all good questions you've raised. But I want to make sure that in addressing these issues, we don't lose sight of the most important thing. Sometimes we can be all about the business of church and forget the one, the most important one. So he starts out in chapter 15, verse 1. Now I make known to you, brothers, the gospel, which I preached to you, uh, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved. He said, that's the gospel. He said, I preached it to you, and you received it, and you stand in the gospel, and that's how you are saved. That's how that works, Paul says. And then he says, um, if you hold firmly to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I handed it down to you as of first importance. There we see Paul saying, this is the main thing. Our governing board met earlier this, this uh, month, 
And we made, uh, at that meeting, we made significant decisions on building maintenance and repairs. We formulated policies that supported fiscal integrity. We implemented security measures, and we addressed contract negotiations. These are all really important things that we needed to do. There's not a guy on the board that would say, yeah, that's not important stuff. We need to not do that. No, everyone there said, I mean, you could tell by how we were discussing things that those things were important decisions. And we needed to make those decisions, and we made those decisions. But though all those decisions, every one of those decisions, were made in the support of the advancement of the main thing, which is the advancement of the gospel. And here is Paul's outline of the gospel in simple terms. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, he says, For I handed down to you as first importance. In other words, I want you to know that this thing that I'm going to talk about next is the main thing. And I don't want you to lose sight of this as you're, as you're dealing with these issues. And here it is. I hand it down to you as first important, number one, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried. This is not something that happened suddenly. It was not some new idea that came out of nowhere. Christ the Messiah died. Uh, his death and burial had been present and predicted and preserved in the pages of Scripture in a variety of places for over a thousand years. This was not some sort of Johnny Come Lately idea. Paul completes his outline going on to the third point in verse 5 by saying, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. There it is again. And that he appeared to Peter and to the twelve, then to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then again to all the apostles, and last of all, As to one untimely born, he appeared to me. So Paul wants to say, this is the gospel in simple terms. That Jesus died and he was buried and he was raised and he appeared to many people. So that there would be proof both of his death and both of his resurrection that he actually did fulfill what the scripture said. And he said, this is the gospel. Christ Jesus, if you look at Christ Jesus' death, you think like, how can, you know, the word gospel, you know what that means, right? It means good news. We hear the word gospel, we, we don't really know what that means. But it means good news. In other words, this is the good news that Christ died and was buried. Why in the world would that be good news? You know, when When Hitler died, when Hitler was defeated, that was good news. When Saddam Hussein was killed, that was good news. Why? Because these were evil men who wanted to do evil. But why was it good news when Jesus died? Because his death put to death our death. (laughs) His death put to death our death. The penalty that we owed could not be paid by us. Jesus had to step in and pay that for us. That's why Jesus' death was good news. But even after, Paul says, well, yeah, I preached that to you, and you accepted it and received it, and you're standing in that, and and, and that's the way you're saved. He says, I'm hearing that some of you in the church believe that even though Jesus was raised, that there's no resurrection for you. And in fact, you're, you're actually are saying, that they were actually saying, there's actually no resurrection at all. And Paul goes like, wait a minute, let's think about this. So Paul begins to reveal the inconsistencies of their beliefs, starting in verse 12. Look at verse 12, it says, now, if Christ is preached, and they, everybody in the pew would be going like, yeah, Christ is being preached. If Christ is being preached, that he's been raised from the dead, and they're all shaking their head like, yeah, Christ has been raised from the dead. How is it that some of, among you say that there's no resurrection from the dead? Like none. How is that possible? Then in verses 13 uh, to 19, Paul says, he lays out seven logical conclusions to their belief system. The belief system of the Christians in the church who are happy, who, who you know, are glad that Jesus was raised from the dead, and, and they, 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 who, that's their hope. 
But he says that there's a problem here. You're not really thinking this through. But if there's no resurrection from the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And they're going like, huh, okay. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. And we are false witnesses of God because we testified against God, actually, that he raised from the dead that he, when he actually didn't, if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ is raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is worthless. You know, coming here on a Sunday morning is kind of like a meaningless exercise. Believing in God is like a meaningless exercise. Then all, also those who have fallen asleep, those people that you love, your friends, your family, that believed in Jesus and now are, are dead, they've actually just, actually just perished. If we have hoped in Christ only in this life, if this is just something we're doing while we're alive, we are of all people to be most pitied. Paul is saying, man, if the resurrection is not real, there's a real, uh, there's a real problem here. That, that, that makes all the difference in the world. Let me list it for you. Eight different things. If there's no resurrection, Jesus is still dead and his lifeless body is still in the grave. Number two, everything we taught you is actually worthless, even though you admire us so much. Number three, your faith is useless. Number four, we, all, we apostles, we're just a bunch of liars. We made up this story. Number five, if the resurrection is not true, Jesus didn't actually provide any forgiveness for your sins. Number six, you still then have to face the condemnation of your own sins before God, which there is no escape. Everyone who died hoping in Jesus is hopelessly lost. Number eight, we have put our faith in a lie, and we should be pitied more than anyone else. Why? Because the hope that we talk about that we have in Jesus is so awesome and great and powerful. Is it not? Is our, not our hope wonderful? Amen. Is not our hope like gets us excited to think about after our life? But if it's not true, then there's a problem. Like, like Pastor Mark Drissel said, uh, if Jesus is actually dead, then Christianity is dead. Say that with me. If Jesus is dead, then Christianity is dead. And my faith is worthless. And my sins are not forgiven. And I have to face a God without any defense. And I have nothing to say for all the sin that I've committed every day. I have, no, I have no way to face God and be okay. I have no hope. But then say this, but if Jesus is alive, say that with me, but if Jesus is alive, but if Jesus is alive, then Christianity is alive. And I can, I can be in the presence of my Father safe and secure. My sins are forgiven. And Jesus paid it all. Amen. All to him I owe. Amen. Sin had left this stain I couldn't get out, like chocolate in a, in a carpet or whatever, or wine or whatever. I can't get it out, God. I can't get it out. I, I don't want to be that way before you, God. But I am. And Jesus says, I got it. And Jesus spilled his blood over that stain, and he made it white. Yes, if Jesus is dead, then we are all men to be pitied, pitied. But if Jesus is alive, we are to be admired and celebrated. Why? Because we have the greatest hope in all the world. And it is not a hope so, maybe so. It is the reality of hope that will, that will be fulfilled when Sharon's brother died recently. He was, not, he was not mourning. He was not afraid. He was hopeful. He was ready. He was eager. Lord Jesus, take me. I'm ready. Yes. We have hope. The resurrection, the facts of the resurrection are the facts that, the, the evidence of our own hope. Verse 20 
Paul says, after he gets done with, well, if, you're, if Jesus is dead, then, then these are the problems you're going to have to face. But then he gets to verse 20, and he turns around and he says, but the fact is, <laughs> but the fact is, Jesus is not dead. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, and he is, listen to this, the first fruits of the resurrection. How many gardeners do we have in here? How many people have a vegetable? Raise them up. Come on. Shake them. Yeah, we have some gardeners. Now, you know when you plant the seed and then it sprouts up, you get a little excited because you know what's coming. You put the seed in the ground and you know that seed has to die and be broken open and then a little, little sprout comes up and you get a little excited because you know that, that the process of life is happening. And then that plant grows up and it becomes a little mature and then it gets blossoms. What's next? Fruit. Yeah. And, and then you, you reach down and you go, oh, there's a tomato or a strawberry or a blueberry, whatever. And, you know, they don't come on all at once or like a zucchini. They come like, some, you know, the first fruits are just a few. And you, you grab that off there and you taste it. And you go like, oh, it's not quite ready. And then you wait you know, several days. And then you grab another one. You go like, oh, yeah. And you know that that's the first fruit. The first fruit that you taste. And, and why is that so exciting to eat the first fruits? Because there's much more to come. Much more zucchini to come. Sharon gets all the zucchini in our house. <laughs> much more squash. Sharon gets all the squash in our house. Pretty much. And then there's strawberries. Many more strawberries to come. Many more raspberries to come. Many more peas or whatever you're going to grow. Carrots. Many more to come. And that's why, that's why Paul says Christ is the first fruits because he was the first one that God tasted. And he said, ah, love that taste of resurrection because all of you who have put your faith in Christ are going to be this crop. Jesus was the first fruit. Think of the millions and millions of believers that Christ will call to rise up from the grave. Christ is just the first fruits, and we are the rest of the crop. Verse 21, he goes on to say what the source of resurrection is for the believer. So, for since a man's death, for, pardon me, since by man death came, by man the resurrection from the dead came. For as in all Adam die, also also in Christ all will be made alive. This is Paul's fancy way of saying when Adam sinned, he messed it all up for everybody. <laughs> he messed it up for everybody so that the whole human race had this result of death. That was what Adam's contribution to the human race was. But what is Christ's contribution to the human race? That because of his death and his resurrection, he gave us life. That was, Adam gave us death. Christ gave us life. Thank you, Lord. Paul continues in verse 35. But how is it that some say, pardon me, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? In other words, what is it going to look like? When you and I raise up from the dead, what is that going to look like? What are we going to be like? Paul wants to make sure the Corinthians, in this case, who were heavily influenced by the Greek philosophy, understand that resurrection is the permanent rejoining of the soul and body. How many here are excited um, that you're going to have a resurrection body? Because the body you have right now is kind of failing you. Yeah. <laughs> He's excited, people. Excited. But I want you to know, everyone here, that that body that's failing you you're not going to get a new one. You're not getting a new one in the resurrection. You say, whoa, is that, isn't that bad news? No. Because Jesus can take what is broken and make it unbroken. Jesus can take what is, uh, what is broken down and weak and destroyed even in battle. Think about that. Lost. 
And the redemption that Christ brings to your soul is the same kind of redemption, the same kind of redemption power that God uses to restore your soul is the same redemption power and the resurrection power that he's going to use on your body. So that the person that you would have been had Adam not brought death to us is the person that you're going to be in the resurrection. See, the Greeks... They, they were sort of excited because they thought that, uh, uh, that, that at death, their philosophy was that at death, the soul would be free from the body, no longer hindered by the, the body. The Greeks had a very low... Uh, let, let me read this one more time. Paul wants to make sure that the Christians who were heavily influenced by, influenced by Greek philosophy understood that the resurrection is the permanent rejoining of a redeemed soul and a redeemed body. The Greeks had a very low view of the body, thinking that the body was this sort of trap for the soul. And that death is the only way that a person, a soul could escape from that trap. And Paul noticed that some people in the church had fused Greek philosophy with Christian doctrine and had come up with this conclusion, since my body will be discarded at death, whatever I do with my body has no impact on my eternal soul, who we're in dangerous territory all of a sudden, including whatever kind of sinful behavior I do with it. Many people today share this same low view of their body viewing their body as no more of a, of, a, of a vehicle for their personal pleasure that will be discarded at death. But God has no intention of discarding your body. Whether we're talking about your physical body, whether we're talking about your mind, whether we're talking about your spirit, whether we're talking about your emotions, whatever we're talking about that reg in regards to you, he has no intention of discarding any part of you because God's ability to unbreak the broken is amazing. God has a very high view of your body. Genesis 1.31, think about this. It tells us that when God created man and his body, he saw that he uh, had created it, what he had created, and he said, that's good. He looked at Greg and he said, that's good. He looked at Adam and he said, that's good. God knew what, what he had done was good. Genesis 1.27 tells us, quote, God created man in his very own image. Wow. You are created in God's image. And that includes your body. Genesis 2.7 tells us that God himself formed your body. Genesis 2, 7 also tells us that God breathed his own breath into man's body so that man then became a living soul. How much higher privilege could we have than to know we're created in God's image with God's breath, formed by God himself, loved by God, Jesus Christ dying for us, our whole self, God has no intention of discarding your body. God has a very high view of your body, much higher than we probably realize. Early in our series, uh, Paul makes this, uh, if we really understand the full impact of what he's saying, it's an astounding statement that illustrates God's high view of your body. 1 Corinthians 6.19, you, you probably have heard this a number of times, but I want you to think of it in terms of the moment at which Christ resurrects your body, redeeming it, making it what it, he always had uh, meant it to be, redeeming it, remaking it. Think of, it in the, in, think of this verse now in terms of our resurrected bodies. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is given to you, who lives within you? This body is inhabited by the Holy Spirit. 
when you ask Christ to come in to your uh, heart, you're actually saying, Holy Spirit, inhabit me, every part of me, my body included, my body included, my mind, my spirit, my soul. Raise your hand if you realize that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit who inhabits you. Amen. Don't you realize that your, say this word, body, say it loud, body, my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Say it with me, my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Many view their body as their own possession for their own personal pleasure for their own personal will, to do whatever they wish. They make that decision. Many people view their body in that way. But Paul goes on to say, you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. And this fits the fact that God is going to resurrect and transform our bodies. God has no intention of discarding our bodies. But he's going to say, yeah, now let me show you what I can do. (laughs) Borrowing the agricultural terms of sowing seeds, or in other words, throwing out seeds, and raising crops as parallels for death and resurrection, Paul illustrates the transformational work God's going to do with our body. Can you turn this off for a second? In verse 42, Paul says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. How many of you, raise your hand if you realize you have a, a, a body that's perishing. Yeah. This sort of, that mean, actually means deteriorating. When you stick a, a, some sort of vegetable or whatever on your counter, you just watch it for a couple of weeks, you're going to see that thing perish. <laughs> it's just going to like, and it's going to start stinking up the house. You're like, get rid of this thing right? And that's what, what we sort of have an idea about. We, we think, yeah, throw away this old dead body. It's perishing. But, but Paul says, so in the resurrection of the dead, our bodies, uh, it is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. You will have the exact same body you have, only God's going to go, whoop, and it's going to be all different. It's going to be amazing. You're like, whoa, this is awesome. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. That's talking about you. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now, I want, I want us to be careful that we don't get the wrong impression. When it says a spiritual body, what does that mean? It doesn't mean a spirit body. A spirit body is just a spirit out there without a body, actually, But let's look at Jesus' own resurrection, his resurrection body in Luke 24, 36. It describes kind of some of the aspects of Jesus' resurrection body. Luke 24, 36 says, While the disciples were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Hey, peace, brothers. (laughs) Peace. They were startled and fried, thinking they had seen a ghost, okay? So that's their impression. This is a ghost. Jesus is just a ghost. Because they think, what, what's he doing here? He said to them, why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise up in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is me. It's I myself. Touch me. You can't touch a spirit. Touch me. And see, a ghost does not have flesh and and bones, as I have. So he's trying to help them understand what a resurrection body is like. Verse 40, when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe because of joy and amazement, he asked them, hey, you got something to eat here? You got some fish or something? Verse 42, so they gave him a piece of broiled fish. I like broiled fish. Broiled fish is good. And he took it and he ate it in their presence. 
Like Jesus, we will have a body capable of eating. How many of you like to eat here? <laughs> there will be no Weight Watchers in heaven, though. It's amazing. <laughs> See, here's another reason why I think there's going to be eating in heaven. In, 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 in Revelation 22, it talks about the tree of life. In other words, the tree that has this, and it has fruit on it. And it says something like, uh, with a fruit for every month. And I'm like, oh, it's kind of like the fruit of the month club. <laughs> I don't know if that's the way it's going to work. But uh, anyway, you know. Anytime you want to eat, you just eat. And we're not going to overeat. We're just going to eat. It's going to be good. Right, Colin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our bodies will only experience wellness. Our bodies will only experience wellness forever. Forever. No pain, no sickness, no disease, no doctors poking me in places you don't want to be poked. No diabetes or depression or mental illness. He's, our bodies are not just physical. They're also mental and emotional. No fear, no sadness, no heartache. Our bodies will not have to ward off viruses or germs or pandemics. Our bodies will not be subject to aging or weakness or lack of function or deterioration or memory problems. So, to use Paul's own words from 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and following, in a moment, this is going to happen in a moment, folks, in the twinkling of an eye. Just blink your eye. That's how fast that's going to happen. In a moment, in the twinkling or the blinking of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable. And this mortal put on immortality. But when this imperishable puts on the imperishable. And this mortal puts on immortality. Then will come about the saying that is written. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Uh, if, if any of you have watched Mandalorian, how many of you watch Mandalorian? All right. Remember the season, season two, uh, episode one, big old Hurricane Sand Monsters, swallowing the guys, taking them away. Okay. What was it called? The Great Crate. Well, the Great Crate Dragon. Thank you very much. I just call it a sand monster. Big old ugly guy likes to eat sand. Like, well, that's gross. He likes to add, eat sand and people. <laughs> so they were trying to defeat the great cray dragon, the, the sand monster. Just big, ugly thing. Like a, a big, huge, the hugest uh, worm that you've ever seen with these nasty old teeth. And Mandalorian figures out what he needs to do. And you don't realize it when it's happening. But what he, he kind of lines himself up where the sand monster is going to be gobbling people up. He goes in that position. He gets himself at the place where he needs to be to get swallowed by the great cray dragon. And he swallows himself up. People are going, what's going on? Oh, man, Mandalorian's gone. They're like, oh, no. And the, and the sand monster goes in the earth like it's done. Silence. And those moments are like forever. Can you imagine, you know, having the Mandalorian as your hope, and all of a sudden he's gone. A few moments later, but what seemed like eternity to them, up comes the sand, sand dragon, and he's like, spews Mandalorian out of his mouth. Mandalorian's got something in his hands. He's almost smiling. He's going, pew, like this. And all of a sudden you see from underneath the earth all these explosions, all these explosions, and the sand monster just gets destroyed. Mandalorian went inside of the great cray dragon to defeat the great cray dragon. That's the same thing that Jesus did. He went inside. He was swallowed up by death, not so that he could be consumed by it, but so that he could consume death. 
Death, where is your victory? Great, there's no sting of death anymore. Why? Because Jesus took the sting for us. A little boy and his father were driving down a country road on a beautiful spring morning. Suddenly a bee, a bumblebee flew in, into the car. And this little boy who was in the back, knowing that he was deathly allergic to bee stings, was terrified. But his father reached out and he grabbed the bumblebee and he squeezed until he felt something. And then he released the bee. And he started to fly by, by his son again. And the boy was freaked out. He goes, he goes, no, 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 look, look, look. And right there in the father's hand was the stinger. He said, you don't have to be, you don't have to be afraid of the bee anymore. I took the sting for you. That's what Jesus did. That's why we as believers can say, death, where is your string, sting? Grave, where is your victory? Because Jesus took uh, the sting of death for us. Jesus was raised from the dead. And because Jesus was raised from the dead, we know this, that Jesus has power over death. And the thing is, death is the result of sin. So when Jesus uh, destroyed death from the inside, he also destroyed the effects of sin. He took away our sin. He forgave us. Why? Because God created us, not so he could destroy us, not so he could prove how great he was and how awful we were, but so that we could discover his love and his power that is at work The resurrection is permanent. There is a verse in the New Testament that says, And if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, dwells in you, in other words, dwells, not, not live for a moment, in and out, in and out. No, if, it, if the spirit of God, the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he will also give life to your mortal body, Barb. You looking forward to that day? Yeah. If the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. You know, I want to infuse you with a little bit of audacity this morning. Not just to go like, oh yeah, I'm going to have a resurrection body. I'm going to raise up from the dead. I'm going to live in heaven forever and I don't have anything to worry about. And those things are all true if you have believed, like Paul says, if you indeed have embraced Christ, if you have, uh, if you have put your faith in him. But resurrection is to be about more than that. Resurrection, you know, when Paul went out, he had a kind of audacity that stared death in the face and said, I will not stop preaching. I will put my life on the line. I will put my body on the line. He was beat up, slashed, shipwrecked, abandoned, hated, whatever. He says, I, I know and those are hurtful things. I, I don't like going through those things, but I will go through those things. Because number one, I want other people to know about Christ. And number two, I know what's going to happen to me in the end because of what Jesus is able to do with my body. I'm going to be resurrected. Death is not the end for me. Death is just the point at which I get my reward and I go to see Jesus. My reward. So I want to infuse you with a little bit of audacity. I wanted to comfort you with most of this message, but now I want to send you out with audacity. The same kind of audacity that Paul had when he said, you can do anything you want with me, but I'm still preaching. Amen? Amen. A couple of Scottish missionaries were sent to the New Hebrides Islands. And the day they arrived there, the cannibals 
headhunters, whatever you want to call them, killed them. They ate their bodies. Same day. No ministry happened. Not any known ministry, that is. And right after that, there was a long time that people didn't want to go there. Of course. (laughs) Yeah, I get it. You wouldn't want to go there. I wouldn't want to go there. But even when John Patton agreed to go there, well-meaning people from his church tried to dissuade him. When an elderly man warned, you'll be eaten by cannibals. They'll eat you, is what he said. <laughs> Patton replied, I confess to you that I, if I can live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me, listen to this, whether I'm eaten by cannibals or worms. <laughs> because on that great day, In the resurrection, my body will rise as fair as yours, sir. In the likeness of my risen Redeemer. And after 15 years of fruitful ministry, almost everyone on that island claimed Jesus as their Savior. I want to infuse you with some audacity to say, where does God want me to go? Where is God calling me to go that I don't feel comfortable going, that I don't feel safe going, that my body and my, my whatever is not safe to go there, but Jesus is calling me nonetheless, and so I will go because I know what is going to happen to me in the resurrection. If Jesus is calling, I will not stop going. I will go. Don't raise your hand, but I'm wondering this morning, how much audacity do you have? Will you actually go when you're called to do the thing that you don't want to do, to do the thing that feels unnatural for you to do, to, be, to do the thing that's, that's uncomfortable, inconvenient, and unsafe? I'm looking for some people with some Holy Spirit audacity this morning. And the only way that you or I will be able to tell if you have that kind of audacity, or if you, I should say, if you're willing to exercise that kind of audacity is only through your actions. We can all say, I will, but what actually matters is doing, I will. We all have audacity about the things that are most meaningful to us. And for Patton, it was having people know Jesus. And so he went. And God used him. Because he had this resurrection perspective always playing in the the background of his mind that he knew that when the day came, Jesus would come for him and raise him from the dead. That this life is just a blink compared to eternity. And so he was willing to give it for Jesus. He was willing to have the audacity and give it. And this morning, I just want you to to realize that that's what you're going to need to actually go, is a resurrection audacity reality of resurrection and eternity always in your mind so that that is a louder voice than anything else that's screaming at you don't go they'll eat you Let's stand. All the creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Yeah. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint, let every nation shall of your faith.
That is the longing of our heart that you'd come. But like Paul, we are sort of torn in two. We want you to come. We're waiting for your, your, your trumpet to sound so that we can go into your presence. And forever in your presence, we will always be. That's going to be a wonderful place, amazing place, a place where we will be who we were always meant to be. And everybody around us is who they were meant to be. It's going to be a wonderful place. But Lord God, we are torn in two because there are people who don't know you, who have actually refused you, who have neglected you, who have pushed you aside. And for those people, Lord God, our souls ache and hurt and yearn. And so, God, we are torn in between two decisions. And even though we cry with our loudest and sing with our loudest voice, Lord Jesus, come. We just say, Lord, for as long as you want us to stay here, we will live in resurrection perspective. We will go beyond what we're comfortable with, what we feel safe with, and live in the audacity of the resurrection perspective. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.